something approximately associated with this uh, with the before. But now I see that there has been work done in times that I didn't know about, and I'm really curious to know about this. So can you please help me? Well, um, hi. Uh, what got me interested in this talk was that a lot of us are familiar with Kutanini. But, okay, I'll speak up. Um, but there's actually a lot of really fascinating grammatical traditions that are closer to home for us, at least culturally, not necessarily geographically. Um, so the first thing I want to address is uh, people think about the Dark Ages and whatnot, but that's kind of the historic, a historical myth. I mean, there is a period, there's a period after late antiquity and the uh, early Middle Ages that you could call a Dark Age, but it shouldn't be taken to be a normative uh, a normative value judgment. So anyway, the, uh, this image of filthy peasants and whatnot, just remove that from your brain. Um, so the subtitle of my talk is What the Scholastics Can Teach Us About Constructed Languages. So that raises the obvious question, what is scholastic? Um, so uh, the scholasticism is a name for a movement that arises in about the ninth century, depending on how you want to dice it. Uh, you have people like Alcuin and um, Ariogena. Alcuin was in the court of Charlemagne and described as the most educated man of his time. Um, but they're typified by people like Anselm of Canterbury, the, an the ontological argument, um, Thomas Aquinas, Duns Scotus, William of Ockham. I'm sure everyone's heard of Ockham's razor. Um, and their influence wanes more or less about the end of the 16th century. But um, what, tip of, what, what characterizes it, uh, there's a very strong emphasis on dialectical reasoning and use of logic, uh, Aristotelian logic, not modern logic. Um, the strongest influences are from the church fathers, both the Greek and Latin, um, uh, Western and Eastern, uh, in particular people like Augustine, um, Greek thought, especially Aristotle, and Islamic philosophy, which is what a lot of Greek thought was filtered into. So people like Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and Beroese. Um, So, let's talk about early history of grammar from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages. Um, the two important names that you should know are um, both people from late antiquity, uh, or again, depending on how you want to dice it. Uh, so there's a man named uh, Donatus. He lived in the mid fourth century AD and then Christian, who lived in the fifth century, um, and he was a very important source, so a lot of grammarians would just take him to uh, revise this text. But um, uh, one thing I have found uh, in doing research for this is that there seems to have been, in the time of people like Alcuin and whatnot, a veritable explosion of, in Ireland specifically, uh, Grammatical work. Now, a lot historically, there's a lot of there's a kind of view that these were unoriginal. They just were taking people like Christian and just writing commentaries on it. But recent scholarship seems to challenge that view. Going a little later, jumping ahead, you have people like Roger Bacon. Now, Roger Bacon is interesting because he seems to have been one, and I should say that every statement I'm making here has an implicit in Europe attached to it. So um, when I say he's the first person to understand the con universal grammar, I mean within this cultural context. But um, he, he really seemed to understand the, the idea that there was a universal grammar. Now, maybe you don't think there is a universal grammar, but in any case, um, he, he, he seemed to think there did. Uh, he was a very, very early person, Christian, to have knowledge of Hebrew which was an unusual talent. And um, he, he, he would brag that he could teach languages in three days or something like that. And he famously said that uh, grammar is one, but varies accidentally. So, so we're going to talk about now the speculative grammarians. And the first thing I'll say is if you're familiar with that journal, like it's like a linguistic onion, the speculative grammarian, this is where it came, comes from, but it's unrelated like content-wise, um, but that is where it came from. 
Um, so what exactly is a speculative grammarian? Well, the, um, uh, the first thing you have to know is when you're saying speculative, they don't mean like speculative fiction. Uh, it comes from the Latin speculum, mirror. And so they believed that, that um, language was a mirror, a way of seeing into reality. And through that, through uncovering the fundament of language, they could get into that. Um, there's about three different generations. I'm mostly interested in the last generation, but if you're researching this subject, there's, it, it applies to several different groups of people. But um, they, um, one thing that they really seem to grasp, and they're one of the first people to grasp that I'm aware of, is that they seem to understand the difference between study of a language and study of language qua language. Um, you know, you have like like the grammars, the classical grammars like Christian are just they're just accounts of Latin. They're just accounting the grammar of Latin. Um, but they they uh, one thing they were incredibly preoccupied with. Now you have to understand this is in the 13th century, and uh, the significance of that is the recovery of Aristotle. So to them, Aristotelian science is this brand new thing, and what they're concerned about is is the study of language a science. Now, I should mention that science, or what's usually translated as science, scientia in Latin or episteme in Greek, um, is a much broader term. It's comparable to, I hope I'm saying this right, but uh, Wissenschaft in German. It's a broader term, but basically something like a methodological study of something. Um, that's kind of vague, but you get the idea. Um, so just as we have, we have these kinds of debates today, people are preoccupied with uh, in philosophy of science, things like the uh, demarcation problem. So, you know, people talk about falsifiability, and people like Popper and Carnap and whatnot. So it's really just analogous to that, this preoccupation that they had. Um, so, let's see. so the main guy I want to talk about is a guy named Thomas of Erfurt. Um, he, what we know about him is that he probably was educated at the University of Paris and he taught at the University of Erfurt. That's what we know about him, <laughs> literally. Uh, he did write, there are six surviving works. One is potentially contentious, but as far as I'm aware, most people say he wrote it. So he, uh, he wrote the most important of grammar, which we'll get to, but he also wrote four commentaries. Two were on Aristotelian texts, on the categories, and De Interpretatione, or Peri Hermeneus, Latin or Greek. And then he also wrote commentaries on the Isagoge by Porphyry and the Liber Sex Principiorum, which is an anonymous text. Now, what's significant about this is that these form what are called the Logica, um, the Logica Beta, uh, which it, or the old logic. Now, that is in compare, and sometimes some works by both theists are included in that. But um, it's significant because it's in contrast to the Logica Nova, which are these new Aristotelian texts that were being recovered by these translators to the Arabic world. Um, now, I don't have a picture of him, but that is a picture of the city of Erfurt from the Nuremberg Chronicle. So, a kind of interesting side fact. Uh, for up until about the 1930s, uh, his most famous tract was Confused. It was thought to be written by the philosopher Duns Scotus, who I have in the middle of the slide. And so there's several people, two people in particular, Charles Sanders Peirce and Martin Heidegger, who wrote about him unwittingly. They didn't realize. So he's actually gotten more knowledge than he would have otherwise. Um, the modest, the school, seemed to have influenced Scotus incidentally, but probably not Erfurt himself, because uh, Scotus died before his works were ever so, we'll get to the meat of it. Um, the Tractatus de Modis Significandi Su Grammatica Speculativa, uh, a treatise on the modes of signifying or speculative grammar. Um, it's his most important work. It's a foundational text within this kind of modus paradigm. Um, he is very explicitly, he and his comrades, cohorts, are very explicitly critical of the myopia of people like Christian that. They, they give accounts of what, but not why or how. Um, and, and there's really kind of, there's several distinctive features of this, this linguistic theory that they have. Um, there's a tripartite theory of meaning uh, with uh, what are called modes, and I'll get back to that in a second. But he also has a distinction between what he calls etymology, etymologia, and um, diasynthetica, which is, so etymolo etymolo um, etymology would be something like what we call Lexicology, 
lexicology or like study of lexicons and whatnot, whereas Dysynthetica would be something more along the lines of um, like the composition of atoms and whatnot. So, and then also he draws a distinction between signification and uh, co-signification. So signification would be something like um, you have a root and it refers to uh, some sort of substance or whatnot, and co-signification would be how it functions syntactically within an utterance, within discursively. Um, and so they talk about these, these modes of signifying. Those are determined by modes of understanding, concepts in our brain, and then modes of being, modes of essence, which are emanate kind of from objects. It, it, it's very mired in an Aristotelian um, epistemology. So the sad part is that it didn't last very long. It collapsed. But why? Well, the problem is that it seemed um, it was really unsuited with kind of malformed or incomplete speech. There's parts where he tries to give accounts of what we would call maybe pragmatics or um, paralinguistics or whatnot, but it really just didn't seem to work. Um, there were simpler theories uh, which just rendered it uncompelling, it was not post-minus. And in to say that, that red has an existence of its own. So you compare that to someone like Akka, who's a nominalist or very Don, who said, no, that's just that's a linguistic artifact. It has no, it has no reality of its own. Um, and the uh, Buridans, the nominalist school, eventually won out. So, so let's talk about con, what I call con linguistics or metacon language. And so I'm sure all everyone's here, as I said, familiar with Kanye Neem. But what I want to know, and I fortunately don't have a good answer for this, but I'll leave it as an open question: What might a constructed linguistics look like? Now I've given an example. But um, to what extent is modern linguistics tethered to Indo-European languages? Now I want to be clear, it's obvious that we can express, we have the capacity to express facts about all languages, but is there, are there cognitive biases? Do we treat what is Indo-European as the default or normal? Um, and can we work backwards from very to particular? So like I tend to value in my own linguistic uh, conlang stuff, I, I like Chomsky, so I write, I make stuff, that, work, that squares well with Chomsky. I, I avoid stuff that's problematic for that, which is kind of cheating, but it works out well. <laughs> <laughs> so, the last question I'll leave you with is, what would a conlang informed by modism look like, and what would they have thought of them? I can't, I can't even begin to answer the second question, but um, as to the first, I think that, um, for example, they would uh, word classes, uh, you know, we have um, zero derivation in English, like I eat a fish, I, um, I went fishing, or stuff, stuff like that. Um, someone used the example the other day of pancake uh, as a verb. Um, so I, I think that in a, a language informed by this, would be, that would be very prevalent. But um, I, there would, because there are, in theory, an unlimited number of modes, you can have essentially unbounded numbers of syntactic relations. Um, so, anyway, uh, that's it. So, does anyone have any questions? So, you have him uh, in the list of translations you gave. Uh, I read the fourth read, so Neil Platonist. Yes. But this is a little bit before the Neil Platonist got reading phase, but do you think that way of thinking about the world? Um, had any influence or any traces in uh, the modes as well? So the Isagoge by Porphyry was a very common, essentially, textbook oh, that was right. used at that time. Um, I, I don't actually know what how much of Porphyry they had access to. My sense is that they didn't have that much. I could be wrong. I know that at this time, um, Proclus and Iambicus had been starting to Actually, they come a little bit later, if I'm mistaken. But um, my, my tentative answer would be to say 
not especially, yeah. but uh, I, I, I'd have to look that up more, but it's a good question. That's like an owl with a big nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I was looking for a picture and I thought, okay, well, it's like kind of like the birds are asking, I don't know, it made sense to me. <laughs> exactly, no. Yeah, this uh, notion of uh, con linguistics is really interesting. This is something I've been thinking about. I, I'm a linguistics professor, and my research is on uh, sign language. Okay. Um, and sign language linguistics has, for a long time, been done through the lens of spoken language. What results have we got from spoken language? Syntactic constituents, syllables, mm -hmm. phonemes. And so these ideas have just sort of been imported directly into sign language linguistics yeah. and trying to make sign languages fit these ideas. Um, part of that was to bring sign languages in line with spoken language so we could say, ah, they're real languages, they're worthy of study. Mm -hmm. So the goal was noble. Yeah. And the goal was achieved. And now that we've done that, we have the flexibility to step back and say, well, but sign languages are really different, mm -hmm. yeah. right? They operate in a fundamentally different way. And so I think about this question, what would linguistics have looked like if we started with sign instead of with speech? Um, and this is particularly important for my research, which is in um, phonetics, right? So you're really at a fundamentally different level. You can imagine yeah. that maybe syntax is the same, right? But phonetics can't possibly yeah, it's so just I mean, the phonetics, I mean the physics of language, how, yeah. how we implement it, how we perceive it. Um, so yeah, this is this it's great to do it as a name of this. <laughs> yeah, well I that helps you know solidify this idea that's been churning in my head for a while. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I love your talk because you told me about something that's really that is exactly what you were just saying. I think that linguistics not only has a Western bias, but it also has a modality bias. Mm -hmm. We need to be science. Well, it's not particularly science. Science, we really want to describe it.